So first of all, thank you, Peggy and Ted and Dutch National Valley for having me back again. Um, last time was an honor and like the second time around it's like, ooh, okay, gotta do this again. Um, as a consultant and diversity strategist in ballet, I've worked with numerous ballet organizations and had intimate conversations with artistic and executive directors, board members, staff, and dancers. At one point, I realized that the lack of diversity in ballet is a culturally systemic problem. And if I wanted to create sustainable change, then I would need to have to study the historical roots of the culture of ballet and its leadership. I would have to take a step back. I would like to deconstruct the culture of leadership in ballet in hopes that we might take a contemplative look at our culture, the existing paradigms, and their re relevance in 2019, and that you as leaders might examine your role and responsibility in perpetuating or reshaping them. Culture and leadership are the bedrocks of society. They inform one another. The culture shapes the leaders, the leaders, the culture. Around the world, we're witnessing a crisis in both, in politics, business, media, religion, as well as the arts. It seems as though the molecular structure of what we used to recognize as leadership has been changing. I think it's important to qualify the type of leadership I'm talking about, because we can be led in many ways, you know, into temptation, into the dens of iniquity, or down the paths of righteousness. Today, what I'm speaking about is leadership that embodies the characteristics of inspiration, aspiration, vision, and motivation. Great leaders enroll us in their vision and inspire us to evolve. They make us believe that we can be better. Cultures are driven by the people, but they're generally exemplified by the leaders. So let's define culture. Culture is a system of patterns around hierarchy, religion, beliefs, and values. It's a, a system of collective behavioral programmings of a group of people that's considered to be tradition and is passed on from generation to generation, often going unchallenged. We're all born into a multiplicity of, of cultures. Some are fixed, like your nationality, your ethnicity, or your race, and others are adopted through relationships, education, sexual orientation, or where we live or work. Sometimes they fit easily together, sometimes they contradict. This amalgam of cultures are the foundation of our social identities, our core sense of self. You see, that's why cultures are so deeply and profoundly personal. They tell us who we are and where we fit in the world. From the outside, cultures can be difficult to comprehend, so there's a lot of judgment around them. One thing is for certain, no culture is idyllic. They all have within them, embedded within them, explicit and explicit biases. Everyone experiences cultures from their point of enter, entry. Your, your gender, your race, your class, education, they all de determine your amount of privilege. And privilege comes in other sizes besides white and male. Depending on your level or your lack of privilege, you can be empowered or disenfranchised. Our privilege can render us oblivious to the cultural inequities suffered by others because they do not affect us. When we are a part of a culture, it's hard to see those flaws because you're standing too closely. That's why I had to take a step back from ballet. Now, most of you have, in, have inherited your organizations and along with, along with it the prestige, the legacy, and the traditions of leadership. How many of you saw problems in, in the system prior to your taking your position, but yet as artistic directors, you have yet to set out to address them? Warren Bennis, a pioneer in leadership studies, said, the manager accepts the status quo, the leader changes it. Today I will, ask, I will share with you my examination of the culture of ballet and leadership. Now this might be uncomfortable, because no birth is without pain, and the birth of a new culture for ballet will be no different. But we as dancers have a high tolerance for pain, and just in case, there are packets of ibuprofen under your seat. <laughs> There's really not. Lock the doors. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so I would like to present three um, scenarios that have happened in the past year, both in ballet and the contemporary world, and then I want to talk about how they reflect our culture. January. New York City Ballet's artistic director, Peter Martins, retires amid allegations of sexual and physical abuse. 18 months later, a lawsuit brought against the company by former School of American Ballet student Alexandra Waterbury alleged that without her consent, a male company dancer took sexually explicit photos of her and circulated them to other male dancers and donors of the company. In her statement, 
uh, Waterbury accused the company of, quote, condoning a fraternity-like atmosphere that permeates the ballet and its dancers and emboldens them to disregard the law and violate the basic rights of women, end quote. April, an anonymous survey of the Paris opera dancers was leaked to the public. It revealed that 90% said that they did not think the company was managed well, 77% said that they had experienced bullying in the workplace or witnessed a coworker being bullied, 26% said that they had experienced sexual harassment on the job or witnessed a coworker being sexually harassed. September, the former employees and apprentices of Jan Fabre's company, Trublaine, penned an open letter exposing the culture of the organization. Quote, Humiliation is daily bred in and around the rehearsal space of Trublaine. Women's bodies in particular are the, are the target of painful and often bluntly sexist criticism, regardless of their actual physical condition, end quote. Now, Trublaine and Fabre are not of the ballet world, although ballet is the first language of many of his dancers. He's an interloper of sorts. He's an artist who views the body as, as an object and he investigates boundaries in all forms. But something about the culture of ballet drew it to him and made it a perfect fit for his work. So we could look at, at the disgrace as extreme examples using the one bad apple theory, or we could be courageous and responsible and take the opportunity to in interrogate a culture that allows this to happen. When I look at all three data points, I see sustained dysfunctional cultures. Remember our definition of culture, collective behavioral programming. So ballet shares commonalities with the entertainment industry and the Catholic Church. Both are, are under scrutiny currently. All three have hierarchical, hierarchical power structures with collective behavioral programming, all center around a philosophy, a person, or a lifestyle that glorifies, that is glorified or idol, idealized, idolized. To participate in these cultures, uh, requires that you subscribe to the beliefs and practices not to question and ignore the secrets that are out in the open. One's loyalty and dedication are measured in supplication and silence. It's not a coincidence that the word culture begins with cult. When cultures restrict at their narrowest points, they become unhealthy, toxic, and even abusive. For the Catholic Church, in service to God, they are blind to godless deeds done by godly men. In Hollywood, where influential men are like gods, for fortune and fame, the community turns a blind eye to predacious, abusive behavior. A sort of virtuous blindness develops. Author Jose Saramago penned a novel called Blindness. In it, he writes, I don't think that we go blind, I think we are blind. Blind, but seeing. Blind people who can see, but do not see. From the outside, it's hard to see how cultures devolve to this point. It seems impossible that people don't see. Sarah Mago again. All stories are like, are, are like those about the creation of the universe. No one was there, no one witnessed it, yet everybody knows what happened. We might not have been there when it occurred, but we all know that it did. So my theory about how ballet gets to this place is partly rooted in the natural erosion of physical, mental, and psychological boundaries that are inherent and seen as necessary in our field. We all know that it's impossible to teach dance without touching the body. Tactility is a part of our form. The natural physical boundaries that the rest of the world subscribes to don't exist for us. I mean, what exactly is inappropriate touching in dancing? I mean, dance, in, technically, it's artistic groping to music, right? That's what we do. At an early age, dancers become accustomed to being scantily clad and physically touched and manipulated by their instructors. Students, as well as their parents, have to recontextualize the idea of physical touch and normalize commentary and scrutiny of the body. Then, when students are entering the most vulnerable stage of development, puberty, they begin partnering. This is the beginning of the erosion of the physical boundaries. So for girls in ballet, the onset of puberty can be the first time that their bodies betray them with budding breasts and widening hips. At an age when most girls are taught to be hyper-vigilant about the, the privacy and protection of their bodies, ballet requires that not only the hands of their instructors, but those of their classmates touch them in places that only certain doctors and lovers should be familiar with. Should a girl become squeamish about being touched or handled, she's told she's in the wrong business. This is when dancers, especially women, learn three things. To physically submit, to disregard their feelings, and most injuriously, to be silent about the first two. 
The erosion of physical boundaries and the suppression of feelings results in a lack of personal agency. We often focus on women. However, men are equally as vulnerable, especially for those struggling with their sexuality. For both genders, it's a very confusing time, and culturally, none of this is ever formally discussed or taught. We're simply programmed to accept it, and never to question, and never to challenge. So let's talk about the psychological boundaries. Typically, children reflect the value systems of their parents, but for young dancers who board, ballet faculty become their, their primary caretakers. Hence, these children are not shaped in the image of their parents reflecting their values and morals, but in the image of their teachers. And, though, and, and their teachers, their primary focus is on the art and not on the development of their character. Ballet objectifies the body and programs the student to worship and attach value to the ideal balletic aesthetic. The arch of their feet, the shape of their legs, the amount of turnout and flexi uh, flexibility they have become barometers of their worth. Since ballet focuses on the artistic and not the personal development, their identities are defined both aesthetically and by the affirmation of their instructors and then their artistic directors. Ballet romanticizes the de dehumanization of the body by regarding it as an instrument, a tool akin to clay. A tool is devoid of feeling and of thought. Self-objectification is the price of admission and is held up as a badge of honor. To push back on it is a defection. To call it into question, it call, and if you do, it calls into question your dedication to the art. Do you really want this? The desire for agency is warned against. The verbalized questioning of authority draws ire and retaliation. Autonomy, intellectual individualism, self-possession work against the hive mentality of the corps de ballet. In ballet, the underdevelopment of the self supports the art because like gesso on the canvas, it primes the mind and prepares it to be absorbed into the body, the corps de ballet. To dance in the chorus, to relinquish one's personal identity and embrace uniformity. The, lack, the less lack of self you have, the easier it is to suppress. In the cult mind, the willingness to do so is regarded as dedication. The irony is that the culture of ballet does not actively ask you to find yourself like you find your fifth, but then it asks you to express yourself. Think about that. Now, that may seem like a harsh analysis, of ballet, and you may want to dismiss it out of reflex. But if you're really honest, you have to admit that it is recognizable. And we can argue the, um, the degree over cocktails later yeah. under the stipulation that you might not be aware of it because it doesn't affect you. But let's say theoretically that this is true. Can you see how the accumulation of these things could lay the foundation for the three examples that we talked about before? As leaders, are you comfortable with these cultural norms? Do you believe that the system itself is ballet? Do you feel an ethical and moral responsibility for the climate of your com company or school? What beyond the skills needed to be successful on stage are you embedding in these young people? Let's imagine that ballet, what ballet might look like if dancers had agency, if, we're, if they were expected to think critically, to question criteria and standards, if they were asked to participate in finding solution to problems in, in, in the system. If dancers, especially women, had more agency over their bodies and the use of them, might it produce more female artistic directors and choreographers who would tell their stories from their perspective? And then what would ballet look like? Agency is a form of power. If dancers had power, would it radically transform the art itself? Would the standard diminish or would it expand? How would it change the role of leadership? Now, the last question confronts ballet's hierarchical power structure. Ballet puts all its trust in the artistic vision of one person and their ability to lead. As a member of the design and facilitation team of the Equity Project, which is a learning cohort of 21 North American ballet companies designed to increase the presence of blacks in ballet, I've discovered interesting themes around artistic directors due to the hierarchy. They tend to be beyond reproach in their artistic and aesthetic choices. Their behaviors and practice are often unchecked and enabled, and they're generally disconnected from the rest of their organization. Often ADs don't realize how necessary their leadership and direction are to their organization beyond the company.
The hierarchical structure acts as a gatekeeper to people who are lower on the totem pole by restricting their access to leadership even when their insight and expertise are valuable assets. Ken Robinson, the international advisor on education in the arts, says, the role of a correct a creative leader is not to have all the ideas, but to create a culture where everyone can have ideas and feel that they're valued. Now, we tend to think of organization as constructs, but organizations are people, and they should, they should work in service of the people, not in the reverse. Organizations should reflect the values and the principles of the people who are currently running them, not merely reflect those who founded the, them or ran them in the past. The insights and opinions of staff and artists should be valued and taken into consideration. They should be expected to call out the culture for its betterment without fear of retribution. This is the, what real dedication looks like. The True Blind Dancers explained that their letter was not an attack on artistic freedom. They wanted to raise some fundamental questions. They said, what are we so desperately protecting and justifying in the name of art? Who do we protect? And why do we want to continue to follow this course? I ask, does our culture support and pr protect and defend the art, but not the artist? The resistance to change is usually attributed protect to protecting the standard of ballet. The standard in the canon of all classical arts has always been dictated by Eurocentric males. Hence, who better to mind the gate than other Eurocentric males? Gatekeepers decide who gets to come in, when, how wide the gate gets swung open, and for how long. Gatekeepers are the protectors. That is the narrative of the white man in a nutshell. To be a gatekeeper is the white man's inheritance. Now. I want to acknowledge that just as I was born black and highly attractive, we do not get to choose how we come into the world, and we don't get to choose the privilege or the burden that's attached to it. So it's not about attacking the white man. It's about understanding the structure of privilege and power. Gatekeeping is power, and it doesn't matter what's behind the gate. It's the idea that there is a gate and that somebody gets to control it. Hashtag Me Too pierced the insular bubble of ballet that ballet lived in. Totemic shifts in racial and gender demographics will not support old paradigms. And this generation is unwilling to accept the old terms of old cultural agreement. Ballet has to, has to shift with it, and it can. It's time for a changing of the guard, and here's how we can start. A global non-for-profit organization, Catalyst Research, did a study on inclusive leadership of youth from six countries, Australia, China, Germany, India, Mexico, and the United States. What emerged were four attributes of an altruistic leadership that, that linked to inclusive, an inclusive workspace. They are empowerment, accountability, courage, and humility. Empowerment looks like expanding the idea of who gets to lead. Balanchine once said that ballet is woman, but from its leadership, you'd never know it. Accountability looks like being able to receive radical cri criticism and feedback and taking it with taking the responsibility for breakdowns, artistic and otherwise. Courage looks like being the first to the party and not the last to arrive, taking a risk to fail in order to succeed. Humility looks like admitting that you don't know, admitting when you're wrong, and not having to the, be the hero or the savior, but being the facilitator. Working to embody these four attributes is the place where ballet leaders can begin. Now, we have established that cultures are collective behavioral programming, so I believe that ballet needs reprogramming. And this may be very American, but I believe that ballet needs a recovery program. So I think the 12-step model of... <laughs> No, 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 stay with me, stay with me, of, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous might be useful to us. So I created 12 steps for ballet's recovery. <laughs> One, we can admit that ballet has a problem. Two, we can examine past errors and make amends for them. Three, we can admit that we don't have the answers but are committed to finding them. Four, we can have the courage to examine where our, our implicit biases lie and address them. Five, begin to empower others by developing effective communication within our organizations at all levels. Six, commit to co creating a system of checks and balances within our organizations at all levels. Seven, commit to transparency both within our organization and with the community at large. Eight, commit to creating new codes of behavior with diversified power structures. Nine, gather together as a communi community for education. 
10, exercise accountability for holding up the new vision and cultural philosophy of ballet as a community. 11, practice allyship by yielding the space to those who are underrepresented either in body or in voice. 12, work to embody the qualities of inclusive altruistic leadership. I have faith in ballet because the people, the spirits drawn to it, are those that innately tap into the most universal and primal form of human communication. Look, we're dancers. We are adroit at shifting our weight and finding our center. When the era of the impresario faded, ballet found a new center and thrived. When ballet crossed the ocean, lost its tutu and got jazzed up, ballet found its center and it thrived. We, as lovers of it, must have more faith in its resilience. It's stronger than all of us combined. If we, as a community, stand on our love of ballet and not our ground, which is that of an antiquated cultural system, Together we can move the form forward and have it exemplify how the world should be, not merely reinforce what it has been. So with that I say, let's take it from the top. Five, six, seven, eight on the one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>